Hello, everybody. Buongiorno. Um, welcome to the session of today. Um, it has been real pleasure watching all these uh, excellent sessions over the past few days. Uh, only ISPI can do that. Uh, this panel today is Rethinking Security, People's First, the Human Security Paradigm in a Time of Pandemic. Uh, with us, we have an excellent panel of eight experts uh, coming from different uh, disciplines and with various affiliations and coming from different countries. Uh, it will be uh, a fantastic debate uh, around the uh, human security about uh, post-COVID, um, pre or during COVID and post-COVID era. Uh, clearly, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, demonstrated that uh, the concept of security is not all about military. Uh, it actually extends to other areas um, that uh, something that might have started as a health risk uh, and it went on to uh, uh, create um, risks elsewhere and spilled over um, the areas of um, climate, environment, food, water, and it provided um, new threats across different countries. So MENA countries um, being vulnerable uh, from the outset, um, different people have different experiences, uh, which we will go over. Now, uh, one thing that was clearly demonstrated through these crises and the way that governments and people managed it is that the this entire definition of um, risk as well as security have to be redefined. We need to have a more holistic approach um, where we have to factor in uh, other um, uh, areas, other risks, uh, and of course, build human development uh, as a center ground for uh, further action. So um, many countries found that they need help, that they were um, interconnected, they would require uh, collaboration. So if anything, uh, this crisis demonstrated that an international multi-party collaboration as well as a multidisciplinary approach would be required to tackle all these big issues. So in this context, we are very lucky to have um, experts uh, from different uh, disciplines and, and you have the program and the biographies uh, to refer to. I'm not going to go through them, but their focus uh, would be um, on the MENA region and how to better build a secure environment uh, and how um, uh, soft power and, and hard power can be used to uh, secure better cooperation and engage various parties in a more constructive dialogue. Uh, I have with me, I'm very lucky to have Enrica Toninelli as my uh, co-coordinator uh, or moderator. Uh, she is deputy editor uh, in chief of Ray News. Um, and we have a, a panel of eight speakers and with us two that is 10, we have 90 minutes. Therefore the time, um, uh, has to be uh, fairly divided and it's just about nine or 10 minutes per person. So I would urge you to be straight to the point, highly focused. There will be questions and answers uh, and uh, we need to have a, a good debate uh, uh, um, uh, between us. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Enrica to introduce the panel and the first speaker. Thank you, Glauer, for your perfect uh, introduction uh, to this uh, panel. We have the pleasure to discuss uh, this issue with eight uh, speakers uh, who are connected via Zoom, unfortunately. I hope next year we'll be all here in Rome. And uh, we have the pleasure to have Chu Dongyu, Director General Food and Agriculture Organization, Nasser Kamel, Secretary General Union for the Mediterranean, Washio Ihiro, State Minister for Foreign Affairs, Japan. Hu Ongbo, Special Representative of the Chinese Government on European Affairs, China. Hamed Al-Mandahari, Director Regional Office for Eastern Mediterranean, WHO. Valerie Guarnieri, Assistant Executive Director, World Food Program. 
Baiba Bradze, Assistant Secretary General NATO, and Serwan Ismail, Secretary General of the Council of Representatives Iraq. So, I would like to start with uh, Chu Dong Zhe. I hope he is connected with us. Okay, I see you. Hi, welcome to this panel. Um, Mr. Chu, at the beginning of November, you warned the international community that the health crisis will have long-term effects on food and nutritional security. Among others, you emphasized the impact of the pandemic on food production. Can you explain how the Food and Agriculture Organization has been working with national government to tackle this issue? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, moderate. Good morning, everyone and from Rome. And the Italian government is so generous hosting the FAO UN organization. It's one of the largest uh, professional UN organization. So I'm here, it's uh, on behalf of uh, agricultural food sectors. As you mentioned there, and the, we are facing the big pandemic. In general, food system has been proved fire resilient to the effect of this pandemic. You know, they look at all the big uh, 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 major producer of the uh, food sector this year, it's now it's a December, we can say it's, a, it's one of the best sector uh, 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 tackle this uh, big recession and a big challenge. So for, for the market is relatively stable because we are started early March. We work together with the, my colleagues from WHO and the WTO. We send a clear message. We wanted to avoid the prices like uh, food prices, crisis, huh? 2007 to 2008. And this time, and even that time, we didn't expect that the pandemic is so serious globally, but uh, we have established the uh, early warning systems by the big data and the information sharing and also service to the members. And also, uh, 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 I think also we, uh, have uh, already, you know, at that time, we uh, encourage member countries through the G20's extraordinary summit, Minister of Agricultural meetings and the Europe, European commissioners and also Africa uh, minister meetings in the middle of April. And also I strongly encourage all that running the agricultural calendar because that time it's a spring. Eh? We have to produce more first, yeah? Produce more and this for perishable food, you, you have to produce more locally. But at the same time, we work together with WTO colleagues and others. We keep the international trade functional and effective. I think in general, global picture is it's rather good. But of course the uh, national level, the uh, differentiation is there among the members. And the local level, even more complex uh, situation, especially when you related to the uh, uh, perishable products and the price is really high. So I think the, uh, in short, we offer the, uh, uh, we build up the uh, digital FAO to offer the uh, information of the marketing, production and, and others service to that's really helps second also we have a lot of interaction and and meetings with the different levels and with the different groups that's also helps to get a real picture of global picture third i think also we appreciate all the key players to really offer their support for fl mandate and also host country agreement host country here italy appreciate very much uh, the Italian government. We are uh, launched together the food coalition during this uh, pandemic and together with other top uh, key players of our members. And the last of the list, we are strengthening the hand in hand initiative implementation to have the vulnerable countries. It's about the 53 countries, most vulnerable countries uh, from uh, small island state, landlocked, 
and also the least developed uh, uh, countries. So that's really to help the build up the uh, resilience or inclusiveness. And so far, uh, uh, we are seeing that uh, even we, we predict maybe we have added more 132 million uh, poverty uh, for the insecure people. Uh, the situation is even worse next spring. But if we keep more solidarity, more coherence, and more uh, 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 passion, a big passion to help each other, and then we can overcome uh, uh, this pandemic uh, within uh, uh, next uh, uh, months or, or following months. And uh, uh, that's, I'm quite open. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you um, one more question, Mr. Chu, and hoping that uh, this passion you are mentioning will be really widespread approach. Um, let's talk about Africa, a continent uh, which really needs some passion, uh, because uh, is uh, for sure the continent uh, that will certainly suffer the most from the food insecurity in the short term, as you well know. At FAO Regional Conference for Africa last October, the need to transform Africa's agriculture and agri-food system took center stage. In your opinion, which role can innovation and digital technology play to achieve this goal? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Axel Berkowski, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, someone not mute. And uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, and yeah. I think Africa situation in general, uh, it's a, it's a most vulnerable country, LDC, L, LDC uh, 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 located. It's some also other uh, conflict. So that's why the Africa in general, we have to more zooming, more pay, more attention to that. That's uh, uh, no doubt. Second, Africa, I think now facing the challenge, in, in, especially in the East Kong of Africa, uh, 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 that's not only the uh, pandemic and also the uh, locust and uh, follow army war. And some uh, countries are conflict, some countries also the flooding, a drought. So that's really overlapping a uh, threefold, in fact. So, but Africa, they have full of potential producing enough food if you introduce innovation. Innovation, not only technology innovation, and also the policy innovation, and also the business model innovation. So a lot of people talk about the uh, uh, technology innovation. Yes and yes, eh? because I was a scientist. Why you talk about innovation? But actually, why you for, for the international or national governance, you need the innovation three aspects. So that's, I think, we really share with uh, Africa. That's why we are first a uh, uh, minister meeting together with uh, Africa. That was the uh, 16th of April. Yeah, we are not only invite the minister of agriculture, food, and also we invite the minister of trade and the minister of financial. Later, we establish a task force to do so, uh, and not only a meeting. And we want to have a more tangible result. And then for how to change the business model for the uh, FAO, we have a four functional. Uh, to the, all the members, especially for Africa. First is the policy consultation. So we want to have them to establish a more tolerant policy to the individual members. Second, I think capacity building. So that's why we wanted to invite the European Union and China, Japan, America, others. So that's why I come to the day one, we launched the hand in hand initiative. That's really changing the business model because any country who can offer, it's a donor country. And no matter you are from OECD or even from the uh, uh, China or from uh, Turkey, yeah, you can offer something, you are donor country. And then the other country who get that is a recipient country. So hand in hand, it's a matchmaking, yeah? country owned, country lead initiative. And that's a change the business model. Second, investment. So just this week, yeah, from uh, Monday, we are not still not finished, but we got uh, support, the full support of the members to approve the private sector 
engagement strategy because investment is essential for Africa, for agricultural infrastructure, for capacity building, and for the, uh, uh, all the uh, related for broadband. It's not that you want to develop a digital agriculture, you have to have a good uh, uh, broadband and a connection. So I think we have to change the business model, the way of investment. And then, of course, we wanted to build up the, some kind of case. So during the regional conference, we launched the, the 1,000 Digital Villages Initiative, specifically, I think, for the Africa and for Asia, Pacific Island, and Latin America. I said it's 1,000 Digital Villages. It's just a symbolic. It not means only 1,000, maybe 10,000 or 20,000. So that's a way to have the transform a growth system on the ground to benefit to the small holders and get their small production based on the cortex, based on the international standard, and then sell online to Europe, to Italy, or to, to Asia, to Japan, to China. So that's not the traditional business model. And the last but not least, I think we should respect the uh, indigenous knowledge and the, and the practice, best practice in Africa. They can, you know, a cultural characteristic with regionalization and the localization. Any country, any region, even Italy, south, north is different. You deal with the uh, same agricultural commodities. You produce rice here is different from China, from Japan. So agricultural technology and the, and the digitalization should be localized uh, and fit the purpose, fit the local environment. So in that way, I think we can really have Africa to modernize the agri-food system. And at the same time, they really benefit to the smallholder farmers and help them to get the international marketing access and to guarantee their food security. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chu. It's enough, uh, okay. We're running out of time. <laughs> I, I think you both did very well. I was impressed uh, by keep, staying focused and sticking to time. But Mr. Nasser Kamal, maybe we should better that and we should um, uh, also keep the momentum going. Mr. Kamal is Secretary General of the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, it's quite a... Um, a title um, and quite a, uh, an international community to deal with. Um, uh, we've got this north and south divide in the Mediterranean. We've got the uh, uh, rich and poor. We've got security um, uh, issues. Uh, we've got oil and gas issues. So I, I feel for you. I know how difficult your task is. But last month you had a you uh, hosted. Uh, virtually hosted uh, uh, all the um, uh, trade ministers in your conference and you famously said that we need to get back to a new normal and, um, and you thought it cannot be done without the economic integration and uh, trade being the ultimate focus. So that uh, implies that this is yet another a difficult objective to achieve. So please tell us about the obstacles you face in that regard. Well, let me start by thanking you very much for having me in this very prestigious panel. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's not easy to be in charge of a multilateral organization uh, trying to bridge the gap between North and South of the Mediterranean. And let me start by pointing some of the facts actually that this region uh, is facing. And especially in the area of economic integration. We are unfortunately one of the least economically integrated or rather say one of the most economically fragmented region uh, in the world. Uh, just a small clarification, 90% of intra-regional trade in the Euromed region is confined between the EU uh, uh, country themselves and another 9% are between the EU and its southern and eastern neighborhood, while only 1% is happening between the south south uh, themselves. Uh, and that's why, because the whole uh, economic infrastructure in the MENA region actually is designed to be 
uh, uh, serving its trade with the North or with uh, the developing world rather than the developing uh, world. Uh, and if we add the impact of the pandemic, studies are showing that we are going to witness somewhere between 35 to 40 percent drop in trade uh, this year and maybe next year. So that in itself is a huge challenge, as you as you just mentioned. So I dare say the the new normal should not look like the old normal because the old normal was not sustainable environmentally in so many other ways, but also when it comes to trade. And there is, and there were, a lack of political will uh, in terms of increasing our level of regional integration. Trade barriers, uh, uh, lack of transparency, uh, 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 regulatory uh, 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 framework has, in, in a way, slowed down our ability to grow together. Just a small number. We know that it costs four times more to trade between southern Mediterranean countries than it does between northern Mediterranean countries. And it takes three times long. This is unacceptable. So those factors are hampering regional and trade investment and are costly uh, to our ambition to build or to co-build prosperity uh, in the region. So during that uh, particular uh, meeting of, uh, of trade ministerial, we have put in place a set of measures and policies in order to try as much as we can to deal with those inadequacy and those uh, 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 regulatory and other uh, measures that are hampering our capacity to grow together. At the UFM, we're building what we call a, a, a union for the Mediterranean hub for trade and investment, where we will be training local authorities, even lobbying local authorities to do more and to do better uh, in terms of uh, 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 expanding their uh, cooperation and their ability to work together. Because as you said, security uh, uh, is uh, uh, a holistic uh, uh, issue. And if the South does not uh, uh, climb up the ladder of economic development, we risk to have more uh, 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 problems with migration, with radicalization, with political unrest. Uh, uh, another idea that this particular crisis that knows no border uh, is pushing us to pursue is the whole idea of value chains. Uh, I mean, this crisis has exposed the limitation of value chain that depend on production centers thousands of miles away from home. So why not Europe is, uh, is not looking closer to home? And by closer to home, I don't mean only the southern Mediterranean region. I look also to Eastern Europe uh, in order to ensure economic autonomy on one hand, and in order to ensure uh, co-creation of wealth and co-creation of can I, can I bring you we back are working on this yeah. we are uh, working very much uh, together uh, on this thank you very yeah. much no this has been great this has been great but I want to bring you back um, to Mina and to Mediterranean and your remit um, what you're describing clearly is is the um, real complexity but actually not unique I mean, wherever you look, uh, we have the same issues, same problems, and uh, um, the same dynamics. Um, but if you look at the big picture, uh, it might be scary. People might be um, overwhelmed by the problems. But when you break it down to its component, you might find areas where you can make a difference and provide a good example. In other words, there may be uh, models that you can have starting small, um, uh, starting sort of upwards in uh, creating good examples of cooperation, uh, because we've seen how 
in the COVID example, the area didn't do well, the uh, collaboration didn't work out. And uh, previously in climate, uh, again, the same. So if we expect uh, ideal world collaboration, it may never happen, but where can you give us those examples where you can make a big difference and provide a good model? Well, actually, uh, 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 climate change happens to be one of the of the subjects where, where things are going, uh, I, I dare say, uh, uh, much better than trade. Uh, but going back to trade, as I said, we have so many uh, initiatives, but I'm not going to take uh, uh, your time uh, giving you those examples. But uh, when it comes to climate change, I would also stress that uh, the old normal is no longer valid because the old normal is not sustainable environmentally. Uh, and from a climate change point of view. Uh, we at the UFM uh, have focused in the beginning on, 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 on providing our decision maker with uh, uh, science-driven uh, uh, facts uh, uh, on the ground. We have held uh, 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 a network of research uh, uh, in assessing the impact of climate change on our region. And the results are quite alarming. We know that our region uh, is uh, warming 20% faster than the rest of the world. Having said that, this is one of uh, the region where there is an overall consensus, north and south of the Mediterranean, on what to do in terms of mitigation, adaptation, depollution, and uh, 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 sustainable production uh, 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 models. Uh, uh, we are preparing, as we speak, uh, uh, two uh, uh, very important ministerials, one on, on the blue economy and one on uh, environment and climate change. And when I follow the discussion uh, between uh, 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 the ministers involved and the high, the high officials, there is a clear understanding that we need to first adhere to the Paris Agreement, that some uh, of the investment uh, 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 that will be uh, 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 mobilized uh, to put in place the new EU Green Deal uh, would necessarily be uh, extended to the southern Mediterranean uh, shores. Uh, even the new uh, 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 EU southern neighborhood uh, policy and all its financial package uh, uh, is going to uh, uh, focus on investment and job creation with a special focus on environment and environmental. If I may, um, uh, because of, we're running out of time, in less than a minute, I'm going to ask you a very important final question, if I may, and that is about women, um, because in, at the union, you seem to be focused or spending a lot of time and, and effort in making sure that women are empowered and, and um, we would like to know where the trend is going. Is it getting better or worse? Uh, and how women can feature in this new normality? Well, a very quick answer. If you're asking me things are going better or worse, yes, they're going better in terms of women empowerment in our region, the Euro Mediterranean region. But no, it's going worse. The, the condition of our women are, are getting worse because of the pandemic. As we all know that people with pre-existing condition tends to suffer the most. And unfortunately, that applies to social segments that are more vulnerable and women happens to be more vulnerable. So we are seeing lots of jobs, much more uh, in the, uh, among women than between men. We have estimates of 750,000 women losing their jobs in the Southern Mediterranean region because of the pandemic, because they happen to work in area and sector that are affected. Having said that very quickly, in terms of advancing the women agenda, we're doing actually quite well. We are starting this year the first peer review mechanism where country as far as Sweden and as far south as Mauritania or Egypt or Jordan will be comparing notes in terms of what they're doing and what they should be doing and listening to our policy recommendation in terms of empowering women politically, economically, socially, and in terms also of giving the woman a job opportunity. That's excellent. So and the overall picture is positive, but the pandemic has made the situation, even violence against women has increased by 30%. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Nasser. I would like now to welcome uh, uh, Washio Eichiro, State Minister for Foreign Affairs, Japan. Hi, I see you. Good morning, welcome. And uh, first of all, let me start with, uh, um, I would like to ask you some question on how Japan dealt with COVID-19, because I think you did it very well. Let me just put some numbers. Until the end of November, Japan had 2,066 deaths, and Japan has 126 million people. Italy, at the same time, had more than 556,000 deaths with 60 million people. So. I would say Japan tackled this pandemic very well, and you didn't have any uh, big and general lockdown. So I would, last, I would like to ask you how you do, the, do it, and also, since we are talking about MENA region, if uh, drawing from your experience, uh, you have some recommendation for Middle East and North African regions to tackle the same issue. <laughs> First, thank you very much for giving me precious opportunity here. And there are three and a little bit minutes we are given, and my capability of English I can't contain three minutes for what I wanted to say. So utilizing the very excellent interpreters, I want to communicate what I want to say. So let me communicate my message here. And to your question, Exactly here in Japan, uh, we are a natural disaster ridden country. So after disaster after disasters, we have a lot of lessons from them. And in the prevention disaster field, uh, we learn the lessons from these experiences. We cooperate with the various countries around the world. And in order to be able to respond to disasters, uh, we start to include the disaster prevention in the elementary education curriculum and raise awarenesses in community and workplace, which are all hard and steady efforts exactly so far. And the same goes for actually for our response against COVID-19 very much effectively. We raise awareness among people to respect for hygiene protocol in a school, workplace, and other public places. So that has allowed people actually to conform to a series of such measures as a mask wearing, hand washing, disinfection, and having a social distances. So up to a point, the Japanese people were able to uh, follow those. And there are many schools in Egypt uh, which have actually introduced Japanese style education in the MENA region. And then calling for students to comply with the basic practice, such as hand washing. And I believe and I heard that has helped them guard against the COVID-19 well, according to some reports. And also, it's worth noting that Japan had seen it as valuable to build back better from disasters. So in the context of the pandemic, we need to build back better in not just health sphere, but wider fields. Now, with the economic activities and government's finance declining, and then we now see an, another opportunity actually to give our thoughts on how all these lead to a sustainable development. So that's what the Japanese government has considered so far. And against the COVID-19, quality infrastructure need to be developed and uh, reduction of the life, or life cycle cost. So with that in mind, how sustainable development should be. And these, this is exactly what we have considered in this country. So with that perspective, we would like to share the perspective and continue to be a contributor for international community. Thank you. Uh, at the APEC ministerial conference in mid-November, you single out three aspects of human security that you deem are the most important when designing post-pandemic recovery strategies. These are universal health coverage, food security, and women's empowerment. And we heard something about women before. Which, which would you say it is the most difficult for the MENA region to achieve, and which role can the international community play to support these goals? Uh Your question was based on my statement at the recent APEC 
the uh, ministerial meeting, I believe that the most important issue in the MENA region is the achievement of universal health coverage, or UHC. Of course, there are many countries in the MENA region that have high incomes and strong health systems. On the other hand, it is my understanding that in some countries, the economy's economic situation has worsened due to COVID, increasing the imp impoverished population, leading to concern about all people not being left behind the re the, and receiving adequate health care. The COVID is not an issue that can be dealt with by a single country. It needs to be tackled jointly by many countries. Japan, as a member of the international community, is actively contributing to global efforts to respond to COVID and to achieve UHC worldwide. Japan places particular emphasis on the development of vaccines and fair access by all countries, including developing countries. For example, at the Gabi Pledging Conference held in June, Japan pledged approximately $300 million for now. Of this, more than $130 million will go to the COVAX advanced market commitment to strengthen fair access to vaccines for developing countries. We are also proposing to expand diagnostic diagnostics through the Global Fund and promote the supply of the therapeutic drugs through patent pools. Okay, I understand that MENA countries are also participating in the COVAX facility. I believe that cooperation through such an international framework will continue to be important. Furthermore, the empowerment of women, which you mentioned in your question, is something that I believe it can also be further enhanced in the MENA region. Japan has provided bilateral assistance in the field of maternal and child health in various parts of the world, including the Middle East. Through UN Women, we are supporting women affected by COVID in various ways. Going forward, based on the conditions and needs in each country, we will promote measures to empower women who have been affected by COVID-19. The truth is we have not been able to fully utilize the potential of women, and the pace of change is not sufficient. It is important, therefore, that we see the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity to change into a better society, and the international society must work together to generate ideas and collaborate in confronting this issue. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay. So I think that uh, I may be quoting something else for you during the 2019 G20 Okayama meeting. G20 health ministers stressed that global health emergency preparedness, prevention, detection, and response are essential to protect the well-being of people and economies. In your view, which objective should the international community pursue to ensure that the economic and social recovery goes hand in hand? I mentioned earlier about Japan's contribution to international efforts. I'd like to mention what Japan places importance on in preparing for international health emergencies and in restoring economic and social activities. First, in terms of bilateral assistance, Japan has not only implemented temporary and short-term measures, but also medium to long-term measures to build health and medical systems and strengthen the resilience of each country. As is the case with the Maternal and Child Health Initiative mentioned earlier, it takes a certain period to, of time to build a basic medical and health system and development of human resources to support the system is also necessary. Within months of the spread of the new coronavirus infection, Japan has provided approximately $122 million in ODA to the MENA region at an unprecedented pace. In addition to assistance through international organizations with an emphasis on speed, Japan has also been working bilaterally to provide equipment and materials to strengthen the med medical infrastructure in those countries. In addition, Japan is making the most of the support already provided and is devising ways to utilize existing resources, for example, by providing additional support to hospitals that are the basis of third country cooperation and by supporting COVID research at educational institutions established through bilateral cooperation. The international community should also work medium to long term to strengthen the capacity to, of, of countries to enable them to respond to further crises when they occur. Next, I'd like to emphasize that 
in addition to government initiatives, it is going to become even more important to harness the power of the private sector. Industry, academia, and government needs to cooperate in the development of vaccines, drugs, and medical treatment technologies. The government of Japan will work with the private sector to promote the international deployment of the Japan's medical technology and services, and will work with industry to achieve sustainable business operations that contrib contribute to the development of local medical care. Thank you, Mr. Vashio H. Shiro. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. And uh, I would like to move from Japan to China in a certain way. And I would like to introduce Wu Wangbo, Special Representative of the Chinese Government on European Affairs. Hi, welcome to this panel. As I did with the Minister of Japan, I would like to ask you first about the COVID pandemic. Just one year ago, more or less, the first case uh, of an unknown pneumonia was detected in Wuhan. After one year, China overcame the pandemic almost completely, and next year the economy is expected to rise by 8%. So I would say a big success. What recommendation can China offer to other countries, and in particular to MENA country today, and how can international cooperation support MENA, in specific MENA countries, at this stage of the pandemic? Right. Um, dear moderators, dear fellow panelists, I'm so glad to see you here. This is the second time I join you in this forum. Um, I have prepared a text. But uh, it, because of the strength of time, I will go straight to the question first. Uh, China has been doing well for good reasons. Um, I would like to say uh, there are a couple of points I would like to share with you. Number one, human life is most important. It is easier said than done. Because in China, if we let the virus go rampant, no matter how, how advanced we are, we could not deal with it. That's why timely lockdown of a city of 10 million people is the best way to do it. We could use the entire country's medical resources over 40,000 medical workers to go to one city to handle the problem. If we let the virus go rampant, if we were like the United States and many European countries, we have a lot of medical beds and we have a lot of doctors, we cannot deal with the situation. So this is experience number one. Number two, timely identification of infected cases. If you cannot identify the infected persons as soon as possible, the virus will go around to infect others. Social distance, the use of face masks, and sterilization are also very important. Thirdly, unity. I think the whole country to get united is very important. Imagine a country of 1.4 billion people. Once they have information from the government, they all stay at home. Maybe there are some complaints, but they know. Restriction of their personal freedom is not only for the family, but for the whole country, for your neighbors, for your beloved ones, for everybody, and the discipline. I think it's easy said than done again, because to behave in a restricted manner, sometimes really challenging. You know, when you go out, you have to put your face mask, you do not shake hands with the beloved ones, and no hug, of course. However, we all know to discipline yourself for time being, then you have a freedom. 
Personally, I will tell you, in the past three months, I have traveled inside China to almost 10 provinces. No problem. Everybody is there. Everybody is happy because they suffered for this happiness. So my word for the MENA area is that that the international community to get united to support the multilateralism with the, the world w, WHO, the World Health Organization and its leadership. The World Health Organization has been doing a fantastic job. Their director general was attacked wrongly. The whole organization was under tremendous pressure. We hope the situation will change. So the United International Community will help the country and areas like MENA and South Africa, North Africa, and South Asia. Secondly, we should work together. together. And sometimes you see countries, people from different groups who have a different perceptions will pull into different directions. Starting with that, that's a failure. You know, some people, they behave themselves. They try not to infect others, but others don't care. The same applies to international community. We should work together as one. No one is safe unless everyone is safe. Thirdly, we have to work very hard to help the poor countries, the needed ones, like countries in Africa and South Asia. At this moment, there are as many as 46 medical teams from China are operating in Africa. The Chinese government decided to allocate $2 billion in two years to help the developing countries and least developed countries in their fight against pandemic and for their economic recovery. I think there are a lot we can say, but I've stopped here. Thank you. Yes, you stressed the uh, necessity for the world to work together, for the state to cooperate against this pandemic. Uh, in an interview, I would like to quote uh, your interview at the beginning of September. You stressed that at this stage to achieve the common goal of development countries have to put aside ideological differences and engage in unity and cooperation again. But we saw in the recent past how ideological and strategic differences, especially toward China, are present and getting bigger. So would you think that maybe the pandemic uh, will help ultimately to relaunch cooperation between states or it will get more difficult? I think that uh, uh, strengthened uh, international cooperation vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, virus is possible. Um, first, I think more and more people have realized that ideological differences would provide no cure to COVID-19. For instance, when we had a city uh, locked down, one European magazine was saying what China needs it's not a modern medicine or medical treatment, but freedom and democracy. But later on, they find themselves locked down their own cities. So ideological differences won't lead us anywhere. With the change of leadership in the United States, I think multilateralism hopefully will be back. And the United, United International Community will be possible. I think there are three areas we could work together. Number one, we join our efforts to fight the pandemic, in particular, to make available affordable vaccines 
to all the people that need it. Many developed countries and China are in the position to make our contributions. We have already joined COVAX, and we, we say that when the VAX produced by China are ready, we are going to make it public goods for everybody. Secondly is economic recovery. I give for example, people think that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, because of the pandemic, because of the economic slowdown, the Belt and Road Initiative is in trouble. Actually not. The non-financial investment in countries along the Belt and Road region up by 30% so far. And China European Express trains witness more travels than before, although we haven't finished yet. year. We have more trains this year, 2020, than 20, uh, 2019. This is encouraging. So we, we think that when we try to bring back the economic recovery, we can make best use of what Belt and Road Initiative. Thirdly, I think if we think of the broader terms, we find a lot of problems we need to address because of the attack of a pandemic. For instance, how could we deal scientifically the future pandemic? The Director General of WHO has already warned the international community, be prepared for the next one. And secondly, we found the public administration is weak. The public trust in governments is fading away. And also the public um, health facilities are not really up to our need. So we come back. There's one thing we keep in mind. If we are going to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, that will deal precisely all the problems that we have. So this is area the international community can work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hongbo, also for the time. You respected time pretty well. And uh, I think uh, it's, uh, I give the floor back to the Loire for the next uh, panelist. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we will go to Dr. Ahmed El Mandari, uh, Director General uh, Office uh, for Eastern Mediterranean WHO. I guess Eastern Mediterranean can also mean Middle East and MENA countries. Um, Dr. Mandari, um, when you were practicing um, uh, family medicine, um, I was professor of uh, microbiology and infectious diseases in Nottingham in the UK. So you and I would have predicted that the global pandemics, which we thought might be influenza or something like that, or SARS, is coming. Uh, nobody probably would have listened and big guys uh, like um, Bill Gates and others warned. But you also uh, are on the record for warning against uh, an infectious disease outbreak. Um, but clearly uh, until COVID hit us, very little was done and uh, not much of resources were shifted to give health such a priority. Now, you in your position, you're the best person to tell us um, what major lessons we've learned from, uh, from this pandemic and uh, what should be the uh, main priorities in the short term really to avoid a crisis like this in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deloire, for giving me the privilege and the chance, you know, to come and join this esteemed platform. Um, and answering your question, in fact, you know, I'd like just based on the in remarks given by, by colleagues, you know, the speakers before me, I would like to share, you know, two facts before I give my answer. Fact number one, and which we are all aware about, is, you know, that uh, the pandemic itself demonstrated to us the value of freedom. 
you know, the freedom to move, the freedom to be with those whom we love, uh, to live in dignity and security uh, for ourselves and also for those who are outside our, our sort of circle, uh, like, for example, the refugees, the migrants, the IDBs, and, and those people with down uh, trodden. Fact number two, you know, uh, national health systems and structures in place to manage health security challenge, uh, you know, having them in a very strong manner, as you have mentioned, is really very, very important. And this includes establishing public health emergency operation centers, which is a common uh, terminology that have been introduced by WHO and many other organizations. And this pandemic has shown us that countries with a strong incident management system and experience were very quick you know, to mobilize whatever resources, as uh, His Excellency mentioned about the experience of, of Japan, the experience of China, and many, some other countries. Now, the lessons that we, we have learned from this pandemic, the COVID pandemic itself, to be honest, you know, has illustrated to us that many countries, not only in Imru, but around the globe, have not invested enough in comprehensive preparedness and emergency response systems to protect people's health from disease outbreaks let alone, you know, from this big shake to, to global shake. The second uh, lesson, in fact, you know, in addition to the pandemic uh, responses and operations, uh, prog uh, progress in health services that have taken us many years, many years, like maternal and child health, fighting other communicable diseases like uh, TB, HIV, malaria, uh, fighting non-communicable diseases. When, when this pandemic came, it really shaked all healthcare systems it moved and shifted all or almost most of the attention to the pandemic, forgetting about those programs and those group of people. And I'm sure if we go to statistics, we will witness an increase of the number of the say, morbidities or mortalities in non-COVID non related health problems and programs. Now the priorities for us, when we talk about things that we need really to act now, um, I think we, we have to have you know, a very strong strategic response in terms of planning uh, based on a very thorough assessment of existing strengths in our system. What are the opportunities for improvement? I will not call them weaknesses, but opportunities for improvement and whatever gaps that are there. This is very important. The second point that I think we have to have a very good understanding of both the hazards the hazard that countries are prone to and also the health system capacities that will allow us to effectively identify whatever targets and, and have an, an, a balanced action. And the last point is the regular testing of whatever systems we have in order to make sure that yes, we have prepared the system, the system is meant to deal with emergencies and it is really well prepared by testing it on and off regularly through different types of assessments. Well, thank you very much. I think you, you touched on uh, very important areas um, and the value of not only the international collaboration, uh, but multidisciplinary approach, as well as mobilizing funds and resources. So I'm not going to dig deeper here, but ask you one key question. Uh, we are facing a lot of uh, um, poor or weak uh, governments, countries, uh, some of them dysfunctional, some of them have neglected healthcare system and uh, therefore unable to provide good health services. Now, um, you're a reformist uh, and you have seen uh, many of these poor or dysfunctional countries. Um, what would be your best advice for improving the standard of uh, their national health uh, system uh, and, and maybe uh, underpinning their health security? So uh, from your experience, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Durwa, for this important question. In fact, this pandemic has shown us, uh, as you said, a lot of opportunities that we need really to develop and improve. One of the advices, you know, to national healthcare systems that uh, at, at a country level, WHO from the beginning of the pandemic have been asking countries to move as, you know, the, the, based on the concept of um, the whole of government, and the whole of a society and the integration between the two. And when we talk about the government, it is all governmental sectors, plus as have been mentioned earlier, private sector as well and the integration between the two. Uh, every individual here, when it comes into each country have a role to play. And that's why in Emiro, in fact, we introduced two years back, you know, uh, when I go in the, the office, health for all by all, 
It is a call for action and solidarity. Otherwise, we will not be able to deal with any health challenge that are facing us. The second point, you know, we have to have uh, a sort of, um, you know, uh, national and local authorities working together in order to effectively implement whatever plans that have been made at a national level, at a strategic plans. The third point, we have to have, you know, trusted and accountable leadership, uh, which is very important at all levels to fight this pandemic and many other health challenges that are faced by many countries. And authorities at all level, as I said, you know, and across all sectors must govern and work together in order to make sure that our citizens are really uh, healthy and having the well-being uh, under the, the umbrella of the SDGs, you know, the 17 SDGs. Uh, in addition to that, you know, in order for this should, should you know, ensure that policymakers or policy making is coordinated, consistent and inclusive, and it should reflect really, you know, the evolving needs of the population. Um, utilizing the collaborative network is another important point, uh, such as, you know, uh, the influenza centers, national influenza centers, which really helped us a lot uh, during the initial stages of the pandemic in terms of uh, tracing, recording, testing, you know, these sort of things and sharing information. And uh, they are, we have a lot of regional programs uh, for the development and strengthening of rapid response capacities within countries and what we call them, you know, early warning systems, which have been utilized uh, easily in, in countries, even in countries with emergencies. Okay. So these are the messages that I would like to share with authorities in each country to keep strengthening their systems. Well, thank you so much. That's been really clear and very helpful and highly focused. Um, over to you, Enrica, and thank you um, uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mandari. Okay, let's uh, go back to the beginning in a certain way because we started this panel talking about uh, how the pandemic stressed that uh, how it's important to improve uh, uh, and get better the food system uh, to sustain the world and uh, innovation, uh, cooperation between local level and the international level, big data, that all helps to get a food system better. So I would like now to introduce and pose some question to Valerie Guarnieri, who is um, Assistant Executive Director of World Food Program. I see you connected, welcome to this panel. First of all, World Food Program won the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize 2020, Food as System, a Step to Peace and Stability. Normally, war and conflict are the biggest challenges to achieve zero hunger, but the spread of the virus is a problem too. So in which way, uh, in your opinion, has the pandemic increased the threat of hunger around the world and in the MENA region in particular, just to start? to be here on this panel and for that question. And we have seen hunger on the rise for the past few years, conflict and climate being the main drivers. And then this year, we've seen COVID come on top of that as a shock multiplier, pushing hunger to historic levels. As a result of that, um, we've seen an 80% increase in the number of acutely food insecure people, 270 million people now falling into that category of acutely insecure and food insecure. And um, it's a le less in this case about the virus itself, as devastating as that has been, and more about the socioeconomic impact that has unfolded. And MENA is not at all immune to this and is in fact very much affected. Um, and why? Uh, one, because MENA is one of the highest importers of, of food. Most of the MENA region depend on imports uh, for about 50% of their food needs. It's also a very water stressed region, um, dependent on oil prices, which have been affected. Um, conflicts and crisis in the region have produced uh, tremendous levels of displacement and concentrated uh, populations. Uh, there have been currency fluctu fluctuations that have affected food prices around the world. And here we've seen 20 countries 
that have seen a 10% increase in the price just of basic staple food products in the market. And in MENA, we have three countries, Sudan and Lebanon have seen a doubling of some of those basic food prices, and, um, and Syria has seen a tripling of those prices. So what we found is that populations are impacted in several ways, including in this region. They've, uh, they've on the one hand, seen uh, food prices go up in their markets, um, and on the other hand, they have uh, uh, suffered from job losses, from losses and remittances, which make it all the harder for them to afford the food that is available. It also um, highlights and affects the capacity of responders like our organization and other partners to respond and shows the fragility of food systems and, and fundamentally the inadequacy of current food systems to ensure access at all times to safe, affordable, and nutritious food for all and to be doing this in an equitable, resilient, and sustainable way. So all of this has come together with the COVID crisis. Can you um, uh, tell us more about uh, how exactly the World Food Program responded to this crisis, launching a very big uh, operation? From the beginning, we sought to sustain operations for the 100 million pe most vulnerable people who were assisting on an annual basis. And, and we know that that population already dependent on food assistance would be hit hardest of, of, of all. Um, in order to, to sustain, um, we put in place um, adaptation measures in our programs to ensure that we could protect the safety of both those receiving assistance and those providing that assistance, our staff and our partners, um, a massive deployment of, of protective equipment, an adaptation of modalities uh, of distribution of either food or cash support to uh, reduce contact, to uh, increase social distancing, all of the measures that we're applying ourselves in our day-to-day -day, um, life. Uh, we also faced uh, real constraints, not just WFP, but the entire humanitarian health and development system response, just with moving people and goods around um, with, the, with the disruption to commercial transport that we've also all suffered for. So we put in place a, a common services system in order to ensure that we could uh, move and that humanitarian health and development personnel could move to their site and out of their sites of operation and to deliver cargo. 25,000 passengers moved uh, through these humanitarian air services, serving 389 organizations, 90,000 cubic meters of cargo uh, delivered, including protective equipment. So this basically enabled the health and humanitarian systems to stay and deliver, filling gaps in um, uh, where governments were unable to, to work. So sustaining operations was absolutely key, um, but also scaling up operations because what we found is an increase in the numbers of people affected and urban populations are among those where we hadn't traditionally worked uh, as much and where we've had to scale up our work to support urban populations. And, and one of the ways which we've done that is by increasing cash transfers to populations in areas where food is available in the market, uh, but people just can't access it uh, because of cost. And, and so uh, already we've provided more, more than $1 billion in cash transfers directly in the hands of people to increase their access to, uh, to, to, to markets. Um, in addition, um, it's been very important to really focus on national systems and, and working with partners. We've been helping governments to adapt national safety nets and social protection systems that provide basic education and nutritious services and ensure that those social protection systems are expanded to include 
new categories of vulnerable people like urban populations, like migrant uh, populations, like informal workers who were previously able to, to, to cope. And data has been absolutely critical uh, to the entire response. And so, uh, again, working with partners, ensuring that we had remote monitoring systems in place, which we now have in 44 countries, including 20 in the MENA region, so that we can be tracking the impact on hunger, on markets, on a regular basis, and providing that as a global common good through the Hunger Map Live system. So all of these measures and more have been deployed as part of the response. Do you think that this pandemic, uh, the interaction between an uh, uh, organization like yours and government and state has, uh, has get, got better or you still find the same difficulties if you do so? main difficulties, and, and it's because of access difficulties um, that we're now seeing that this convergence of conflict, climate, and now COVID um, have led to four countries on the brink of famine, and we're very concerned about the real prospects of famine in Yemen, in South Sudan, in northern Nigeria, in Burkina Faso. And, um, and famine only occurs when, uh, when access of populations to basic services and act, act, um, actions of uh, organizations like WFP in reaching populations is, is blocked. So better cooperation is absolutely needed uh, there. Um, but at the same time, COVID has demonstrated, and several of the speakers have highlighted this, the interconnectivity of our world and our work. And uh, we have seen the importance of multilateralism reemphasized. The Nobel Peace Prize Award is a sign of, of, of that. Um, we've seen governments, despite facing fiscal constraints in their own countries, stepping up yet again to provide support for humanitarian solutions that work and effective organizations. And we've also seen a growing appreciation that we need to be building on moving forward uh, to ensure that there are stimulus packages and uh, debt, uh, um, debt, debt, debt postponement and actions in place to ensure and increase the fiscal space that nations have in order to respond to, to the crisis. We're going to need to keep the focus on this and further strengthen international cooperation. This is a global uh, pandemic and, and global solutions are absolutely key. Okay, thank you, Valerie Guarnieri, very much for your, this interest uh, points you made out. And I think I give the floor back to Edouard Ware for the last two uh, speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Enrica. Um, we now go to uh, Ms. Viber Braja, um, Assistant Secretary General of NATO. And with the pronunciation of her name, uh, she smiled. Uh, I tell you what, no, not a single person in this room have so far got my name right. Two consonants makes the lower very difficult to pronounce. But I hope I've done yours right. Um, and welcome. Uh, NATO has been challenged uh, by many, many uh, issues, whether they are political, security uh, movements and so on. But health and, and, and COVID have really been challenging and will have impacted your Remit. Now, um, you can tell us better than anybody else uh, which, which are the main security implications of, of the health crisis in the MENA region and uh, how you managed to respond to it. What measures NATO has taken to address them, please? Well, thank you very much for having me today. And I would first like to thank the organizers, the Institute, Italian Institute for International Political Studies and Italian Foreign Ministry. Uh, for, for uh, organizing these very interesting uh, discussions. And uh, you have personal greetings from the Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who, current, who uh, asked me to represent uh, him today. And uh, what I will uh, shortly explain will be both around what NATO has done itself, but also how it has indeed helped uh, the others. As you know, NATO's core tasks are three, collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. 
The response in the situation of the pandemic has been, of course, across all three tasks. So the first, uh, the collective defense, NATO was able to maintain its defense and deterrence ability to guarantee security for its billion citizens. We did adjust our, our operations. We did cancel some exercises and uh, made other adjustments, but overall NATO was able to ensure that its uh, mission is uh, continuing. In this, I would also in particular like to thank Italy it has been a great ally. Not only Italy was able to continue its work uh, in international missions, be it in Afghanistan or Kosovo or Latvia, but also we saw that Italian military played a very important role inside the country and the whole society, the resilience of Italian society has been overwhelming. So uh, indeed that has been something, something that we all noticed. On crisis management, obviously crisis like pandemic, uh, we all exercise for a variety of crises. We all have plans in place. So resilient institutions and plans are essential in this respect. And um, as part of that, uh, NATO was able to respond uh, both each ally nationally, despite NATO not being the first responder in the health crisis. Uh, we saw that there were uh, militaries helping civilians, militaries helping medical institutions, uh, guarding borders, uh, providing logistical help inside the countries. So that was, that was very clear a response uh, that was there in the allied countries. But also uh, we saw that uh, allies had solidarity. They were able to help each other and they were able to help partners. Uh, we saw that allies flew more than 350 flights uh, to help with thousands of tons of medical supplies, equipment, more than 100 field hospitals, and over 25,000 treatment beds. So that showed also that in terms of crisis management, NATO was able to deliver, was able to deliver for the allies, but also for the partners. On cooperative security, this is where obviously our interest comes in that NATO is more secure if countries in the neighboring regions to, to NATO are secure, are resilient, stable, and economically developed. So NATO has a very wide uh, partnership network in uh, the world, and very important region for NATO obviously is Middle East and Northern Africa. For more than 25 years, NATO has been involved uh, with the partners, both as uh, partners in the Mediterranean Dialogue, but also in the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. Uh, ministers, our foreign ministers that just concluded a meeting yesterday actually also had a report on, on uh, Sahel. And our, our partnership and our assistance has been very much around building resilient, stable, secure institutions to be able to guarantee the security and stability. Because again, even with health crisis, we clearly see if there are no resilient institutions in the countries, it's very difficult to respond and prevent okay. health crisis. Right. Well, and our, uh, yeah. All right. Yep. You're going to round up with a final point, or, or shall I move to the next question? Sure, sure. As you okay. as well, you wish. I'm here yeah, to answer your questions. Okay. Well, there are two questions that um, that maybe um, I should direct to you. One of them is to do with NATO's uh, obviously exploring new territories, and one of the new territories for you is dealing with information and misinformation. And COVID pandemic has been uh, a fertile ground for all sorts of false news and misinformation. And clearly, conflicts and instability always makes information and, and communication harder. So tell us about that new investment in, from NATO. Please. Thank you very much for that question. But uh, first, let me also just say to conclude the first part is that uh, a little bit on the assistance we provided to the to the MENA region, uh, it was very clear that uh, it was a priority. So we saw that allies uh, prioritize that also in their actions. So be it in Afghanistan or in Iraq, uh, in coordination with our NATO mission there, Spain delivered medical equipment, oxygen masks, and so on and so forth. 
uh, also others provided ventilators, uh, more than 350,000 euros. Um, so a lot, uh, Tunisia uh, received help. Um, so we did, we did everything that we could. Then on the disinformation, obviously, uh, we saw, and we also have discussed that very widely with our international partners, that there was a big wave of uh, disinformation, which is part of hostile information activities, but also misinformation, that is uh, mis uh, the uh, distribution of information that might not be truthful, but without a hostile intent. So in that respect, what NATO did, we made sure that our own communications are in order, that we have proactive communications in place. We made sure that uh, if we see the hostile information activities against NATO, we debunk them as quickly as possible. We made sure that our people are safe and secure. So we actually have people who are able to follow, assess the information and respond. And we invested and prioritized in digital communications. That is as far as communications is concerned. But we are also looking into how to strengthen resilience of societies. And as one of the uh, previous speakers said, in terms of pandemic, but not only, it's not only the whole government approach or the whole organization approach, it's the whole society approach. With the advance of digital age, uh, we have to make sure that our citizens are digitally literate, that they have the skills and the knowledge to separate what is hostile information, what is meant to undermine our institutions, and what is just entertainment and what is meant uh, uh, to, to, make, to educate them and, and to be part of the wider digital uh, success of our societies. Right. So we also, we announced, uh, you might have noticed a new initiative, uh, so-called resilience grants, uh, which were asking various civil society organizations, groups of societies, institutions, uh, think tanks to uh, file projects with regard to innovative response to disinformation. And it's been quite, quite uh, uh, a pleasure to see how many different projects have come in and how many have been implemented around both for the youth audiences but also for very particular audiences, uh, other people, uh, military and, and many others, to very much provide them with skills to uh, respond. Can to I, um, in, the interest of, in the interest of time, I'm going to hit you with one final question. Sure. But if you decided that it's unfair, feel free to skim through it or ignore it. Um, well, clearly NATO was not only challenged by COVID and, and the changes in environment, but it was also challenged by um, the US president, the Turkish president, but, but with the, with the um, uh, terminals that we've experienced previously uh, over the last few years. But uh, I'm interested in understanding what's the future for NATO? How do you see those accommodated, those challenges accommodated to have a better roadmap for the next few years? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, as you know, the Secretary General has announced the uh, initiative so-called 2030, NATO 2030, which is very much around the adaptation. In its 70 years, NATO has adapted quite a number of times, and this is what we are doing currently. And that concerns both the military parts, uh, what capabilities do we need to be able to respond to all threats uh, that are there against the Allies. Uh, in terms of emerging security challenges, in terms of uh, potential adversaries, uh, traditional threats have not disappeared, new have appeared, but also around the political uh, unity of the alliance. Uh, the alliance is indeed the platform where Northern American and European allies can discuss all the issues. And it's the alliance of values. It's part of our 14 articles that form the Washington Treaty. It's our values as democratic societies. That's why we have committed to defend each other. So this political, political union, political alliance is really at the heart and in the DNA of who we are. And we have to be able to sort whatever difficulties we have among ourselves. And then the third pillar, more global approach. We have 
countries, we have partners uh, across the globe, be it in MENA region, be it in other, and they are all important to us. And there are different ties that unite us and there are different issues that unite us or, or differentiate us, but we still have to be able to engage, to understand and to together minimize those threats that are there, be it climate change, for example, yesterday, foreign ministers discussed uh, also China, and it was very clear that on climate change, China, we need absolutely to be to engage with China, because when we look at the global emissions, uh, it's not going to be enough if just uh, the fair. allies, the um, European Union does it. So there is, there is a need for more global approach to ensure that our security uh, be it in the NATO states or MENA or other regions is not affected. Uh, that, that's excellent. You've tackled it very well and I'm, I'm delighted. Uh, and I couldn't let you go without ask, uh, asking you this question. This was a unique opportunity. But thank you very much, Dr. Braja, again. And um, uh, we're going to move you. to a final speaker, and that is uh, Dr. Sirwan Esmail. He's the Secretary General of the uh, Iraqi Parliament um, Council of Representatives and uh, he's representing his boss as well as himself. Um, uh, and being from the Iraqi parliament, uh, we can't um, ask too many questions about what the government of Iraq would want to do. But from your point of view, <laughs> Dr. Ismail, uh, we want you to update us on uh, really how Iraq or even your parliament is uh, facing those challenges be it uh, health, um, economic, security, and so on, because COVID exposed a lot of structural and functional weaknesses in Iraq, and uh, the parliament is a center of focus. So please tell us uh, how you're addressing those. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Aladdin. Uh, it's uh, such a great honor to be here today on behalf of myself and uh, Mr. Halbusi, the House Speaker of Iraqi Council of Representatives. I want to thank you for your invitation and to be participant in this conference. And it was very uh, insightful uh, to hear from the many perspectives on the issues facing the world right now. I hope that this conference is successful, can create strong partnerships and is uh, Stepping, stepping stone for a brighter future for all of our countries. Although this conference is taking place during unprecedented times due to the hardships of COVID-19, which have affected the entire world economically, socially, and politically, it's now more important that than ever to come together to find long-term solutions to the uh, tragic effect caused by this horrific pandemic. Iraq is similar to the rest of the world, has faced many hardships economically, socially, and environmentally. There has been a step, a stop to normal life. We, as we previously knew, due to the thousands of the people being affected and lost their lives. In regards to the economic reform, the parliament and the government are taking the necessary measures and procedures to fight the corruption, control the entry borders, activate the agriculture sector, as well as support local entities and products. It's a, it's a priority to expand the private sector by giving businesses business loans for investment projects, supporting youth, uh, to enter the business field and promoting entrepreneurship. And security-wise, the Iraqi government is tightening all of its focus on to control the areas of regions and regions that are influenced by ISIS activities. As we all know, the role of Kurdistan regions and also the Peshmerga with the Iraqi national forces uh, were able to defeat ISIS through the cooperation between the Iraq and KRG uh, are continuously monitoring these areas by using armed forces and securities to abolish ISIS and restrict this, their movements within the Iraqi borders. The Iraqi army 
is also getting a high level of training through international cooperation. From here, there are several key elements that we need to focus on for the betterment of Iraq. The priority now needs to be societal peace, stopping the spread of fugitive weapons, decreasing the militarization of society and minimizing internal conflicts. We need to activate the diplomacy efforts nationally and internationally by bringing all to the round table for open dialogues and discussions. Most importantly, we need to prioritize education and the development of higher education because they are the key solution for every country's and society's development. The Middle East and North Africa do not live in, this, in a safe environment to, due to the outdated ideologies. The political revolutions that removed previous regimes in turn just created chaos and new unexpected movements. The military and political interference by some other countries have also caused wars and instability in the region to the point that thousands of citizens have been displaced and have now immigrated to the other countries. We need to come together united and go back to the original principles of leadership by getting rid of the political and dirty intelligence games. We need to focus on creating real peace and strengthening all our relationship through active diplomatic effort. We can all benefit and prosper by creating a healthy and peaceful environment. It's okay. our duty now as participants yeah. of this conference to find solution to help one another overcome the obstacles that not only Iraq is going through, but many other countries as well. Although no two countries are the same, I, what we can... I, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Esmail, yes. can I just interject because I, I got your key message, but let me okay. um, help you focus on a, a key question. Um, okay. With the pandemic starting, there was a huge drop in oil prices and uh, along with other security and, uh, and, and political crisis that Iraq was already suffering from. But the um, Iraq being a, a single commodity economy, i.e. just oil dependent, uh, it's now uh, virtually unable to pay salaries um, adequately. Now, the government submitted a white paper to the parliament that um, contains a lot of reforms, uh, a very comprehensive uh, approach, and the parliament approved it. Uh, it's been a while now. So what happened to the white paper and what happened to its implementation? Uh, yes, sir. As uh, you mentioned, uh, due to the... Uh, war and COVID-19, the ISIS war, and also some interference from regional and international countries uh, with an internal uh, situation in Iraq, especially, we are facing too many challenges. As you mentioned, uh, one of them, the economical situation, so crisis. And uh, regarding this, it's our priority in Iraq to have a diversification strategy that doesn't focus so heavily on oil prices. In regards to this economic reform, the parliament and the government are taking the necessary measures and procedures to fight the corruption, uh, control the entry borders, activate the agricultural sectors, as well as support local entities and products. It is a priority to expand the private sectors by having business loans for investment projects, supporting youth to enter the business field, and promoting entrepreneurship like the rest of the world. COVID has significantly stopped our economic developments, but we are slowly going back on track. However, we need more cooperation and support by international community as uh, to benefit from their experience uh, as well 
to 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 have some loans and financial support and funds in order to be able to to pass this difficult time and crisis well thank you so much uh, very clear and very well uh, articulated um, message uh, and i thank you so much for your contribution thank you uh, thank we you. are a little over time um, i was supposed to round up and summarize but i'm not going to do a detailed one except emphasize that most speakers in fact all speakers emphasized during a pandemic or crisis of this, uh, this scale, they emphasize cooperation, international cooperation, collaboration, and communication, that's three Cs. And then a lot of them uh, talked about the necessity of finding ways of resource mobilization and a multidisciplinary approach. But uh, everyone emphasized the big role that the international agencies such as FAO, WHO, NATO, and others play or, into, or Mediterranean Union and so on in providing a better environment for dialogue, for cooperation and for tackling these type of challenges, be it security or health. But uh, importantly, most of you emphasize the need to come up with being proactive and come up with creative and innovative ways of, of facing those challenges. I think this would probably be the summary that I would present uh, and leave you uh, with the host, um, uh, but before that, I want to thank Paolo Magri and his wonderful team and uh, the entire ISPI family who have really done a wonderful job over the last week, as every year, in uh, tackling those difficult subjects, in creating a, a good platform and attracting so much uh, attention and from the viewers. So on your behalf, I want to thank them, but I want to thank every speaker for sticking to time Having 10 people speaking in an hour and a half it was a challenge, but we've actually done very well. Uh, I don't know, Enrica, if you want to say goodbye or, uh, uh, and finish it off. Thank you. You said everything very well. I just say that I hope to see you, all of you, back uh, in person in Rome next year, and the pandemic will be over, and maybe, who knows, the world will be better better uh, cooperating uh, each state and the organization. So thank you to MED Dialogues and see you next year. Ciao.